Hello, I'm Alex and welcome to the History Chronicles. If you like our work, then please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel in return for exclusive perks, please visit our Patreon page. Now, on with the video. Who was King Edward I of England? And what was the impact of his reign? Let's find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. King Edward I of England, or Edward Longshanks as he is also known, was born on the 17th or 18th of June 1239 to King Henry III of England and Eleanor of Provence, and was named after the Anglo-Saxon King of England, Edward the Confessor. During childhood, Edward was a sickly boy, but as a teenager he had shaken off his ill health and had become unusually tall by medieval standards, eventually reaching a colossal six foot two inches, which is the reason for his nickname Longshanks, meaning long legs. When he was 15, a marriage was arranged between Edward and Eleanor, the 13-year-old daughter of Ferdinand III of Castile. They were a devoted couple, and their marriage was based on love rather than mere political convenience. Edward's life was decidedly influenced by his father's actions. Edward watched as his father, Henry III, struggled militarily to control the unruly barons who, years earlier, had forced Edward's grandfather, King John, to sign Magna Carta. This led to a growing tension between the monarch and England's leading nobles, especially over the issue of representation of the barons in government. There was also personal animosity between Henry and Simon de Montfort, a powerful noble and Edward's uncle, as he had married Henry III's sister Eleanor without permission and had amassed considerable debts, for which he named Henry III as guarantor without consent. This animosity between Simon de Montfort, the barons, and Henry III eventually boiled over in 1258 when the king was forced to sign the Provisions of Oxford, and later the Provisions of Westminster, which stated that Henry would have to seek the counsel of his barons in the governance of the kingdom. Henry revolted against the Provisions in 1261 with the support of the Pope, resulting in the barons raising their own independent parliament, which was then dissolved as concerns rose over a potential civil war. De Montfort initially fled the country, but then returned in 1263 and raised an army. He attacked London, taking Edward and his father prisoner. However, due to the unpopularity of de Montfort and his government, Edward and Henry III were released. Henry III then appealed to Louis IX of France to arbitrate in the dispute. After hearing from both sides, the French king sided with Henry and condemned the barons for their actions. But de Montfort and his followers did not accept the ruling, and after returning to England, both sides started to ready their forces for war. Hostilities broke out when the king's army faced off against the rebel barons at the Battle of Lewis on the 14th of May 1264. During the battle, Prince Edward led a successful cavalry charge, but lost control of his men, who chased their opponents from the field away from the main battle. When Edward returned to the main field of battle, he discovered that his father had been beaten and the rebel barons were victorious, leading him and his father being once again taken prisoner. De Montfort ruled England for the next 15 months, and during this period he called a new parliament in early 1265, which for the first time allowed commoners, or knights of the shire, and burgesses from the towns to attend. This group of commoners in parliament would later come to be known as the Commons, and eventually the House of Commons. Following his capture, Edward escaped in May of 1265, after which he rallied supporters to his cause, amassing a sizeable army to confront de Montfort. At the Battle of Evesham on the 4th of August 1265, Edward's forces destroyed his uncle's outnumbered army. De Montfort himself and other rebel leaders were killed during the battle in the most brutal fashion. Edward was determined to show the authority and power of the monarchy, even if it meant ignoring the conventions of war. Edward had been proven to be an extremely capable leader despite his young age. With the arrival of peace in England, Edward, with his father's support, started preparations to join the French King Louis IX's crusade in North Africa. Due to a lack of funds, Edward and his father were forced to negotiate with Parliament once again. An agreement was reached with Parliament for the money to be granted, on the condition that King Henry reinstate the Magna Carta. Following the agreement, Prince Edward left England in 1268 with his wife Eleanor, and around 1,200 men-at-arms and knights bound for North Africa. On arrival, they received the disastrous news that King Louis had died of dysentery. The combined crusader force withdrew to Sicily, where the French decided to return home. 
Edward decided to carry on to the Holy Land, where the final remnants of the Crusader states were struggling against the resurgent Muslim kingdoms, such as the Mamluks in Egypt. The Christian kingdoms in the Holy Land had been in existence for 200 years, but were now on the verge of collapse as the flow of troops from Europe had steadily decreased over the years, weakening the Crusaders' ability to resist their numerically superior enemies. Edward landed in Acre in 1271 and discovered that the once powerful Crusader states were a shadow of their former selves. Unable to conduct large military operations, Edward instead led small raids on towns and villages. These raids did little to turn the tides, rushing against the Crusader states. Edward's most lasting contribution was the negotiation of a truce for ten years with the Egyptian Sultan, one of the greatest threats to the Crusaders. Soon after the negotiation of the truce, Edward almost died in an assassination attempt. Edward was able to kill his assailant, but was stabbed with a poisoned knife during the struggle. His wife Eleanor, according to some accounts, sucked the poison from the wound, saving her husband's life. It is unclear who ordered his death, as some accounts state it was Baibars, the Mamluk Sultan, whereas others say it was ordered by a mysterious Old Man of the Mountains, who was a leader of a fanatical Islamic sect. What the assassination attempt did accomplish was to convince Edward to leave the Middle East. He and his wife left in September, bound for England. The couple, along with their followers, arrived in Sicily and were given the news that Edward's father, Henry III, had died, meaning that he was now King of England. Instead of rushing home, Edward chose to take his time, visiting the Pope in Rome as well as the French King, in order to strengthen diplomatic ties. After returning to England, Edward, aged 35, was crowned King Edward I of England on the 19th of August 1274 in Westminster Abbey. It became quickly apparent that Edward would demand total obedience from his subjects and was determined to restore the authority of the crown to prevent the civil strife which had plagued the country in the previous decades. One of the first challengers to his rule was the Prince of Wales, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, a Welsh noble who had supported de Montfort. Llewellyn refused to pay homage to Edward as his new feudal overlord, a serious crime in Edward's eyes. Edward sent a large invasion force into South Wales to conquer Llewellyn. Edward's army was able to gain tremendous support in Wales, as Llewellyn was deeply unpopular with many people, including his own brother, Daffid. Daffid had fled Wales after an assassination attempt on Llewellyn. Now he was part of the attack on Wales. This invasion ended in 1277, with Edward's army controlling most of Wales. Llewellyn's territories were reduced to the northwest of the country, but he was allowed to keep his title as prince following a treaty with Edward. Daffid was rewarded with a small parcel of land. However, Daffid, furious at Edward for his slight of not rewarding him better, revolted in 1282 with Llewellyn. Edward invaded Wales again, this time capturing more territory and killing Llewellyn in December of 1282. He captured and executed Daffid shortly afterwards. To prevent future revolts, Edward built dozens of castles throughout Wales and gave his son Edward II the title of Prince of Wales. Edward then considered beginning another crusade against the Mamluks, however tensions among European powers prevented it. Instead, he travelled across the English Channel in 1286 in order to pay homage for his lands in Gascony to the new French king, Philip IV, who had come to his throne the year before. During his time in France, Edward's wife Eleanor fell ill. They returned to England and began touring her properties throughout the kingdom in order to settle affairs in the Queen's estates. But the combination of travelling and the winter weather proved to be too much for Eleanor, and she died on the 28th of November 1290, aged just 48 or 49, in the village of Harby in Northamptonshire. Edward was distraught at his wife's death. He accompanied her body from Lincoln to London, ordering the construction of memorial crosses at every overnight stop along the way, until she was finally laid to rest in Westminster Abbey. The building of these memorials was unprecedented in English history, and surely is a testament to how much Edward loved Eleanor and how heartbroken he was at her death. The death supposedly led Edward to be bad-tempered and cold in nature. This is perhaps best shown in his murderous persecution of the Jews, eventually leading to their expulsion completely from England in 1290. But Edward was not given much time to mourn as immediately the King of France, Philip IV, claimed Edward's lands in Gascony. To preserve his lands and avoid costly war, Edward entered negotiations to marry his son to Philip's half-sister, Blanche. However, on learning of Blanche's beauty, he decided to marry her himself. 
but when Edward sent for Blanche to be brought to England, it was discovered that the French king had agreed that she was to marry the son of Albert I of Germany instead. Edward was furious, leading him to declare war on France. The conflict was short-lived as Edward began preparing for war in Scotland. Indeed, the final years of Edward's reign would come to be dominated by his struggle to gain control over Scotland. The root cause of the trouble occurred in 1286 when Alexander III, King of the Scots, died without a male heir. His last living relative was his granddaughter Margaret, who was the daughter of the King of Norway. Edward was appointed to arbitrate for Margaret as claimant to the throne, which resulted in him reaching an agreement with the Scottish nobility to accept Margaret as Queen of the Scots. He also arranged for her to marry his son Edward, Prince of Wales, thus giving Edward power over the Scots and the Welsh. However, she died on her way to Scotland, which threw open the Scottish succession once again. John Balliol was chosen to be the next king, but Edward, as King of England, was still overlord of Scotland. John and his nobles grew tired of Edward's demands, and in 1295 sent emissaries to King Philip IV of France and formed an alliance against England. John Balliol led an army south in 1296 and attacked the city of Carlisle. In response, Edward invaded Scotland, brutally sacking the border city of Berwick before advancing further north until John Balliol himself was forced to surrender. Balliol was held in the Tower of London for several years before being exiled to France. Following Balliol's defeat, a revolt led by a minor nobleman named William Wallace erupted. He quickly assembled a small army and began causing havoc throughout the country. Edward was in France and had left his forces under the command of the Earl of Surrey, who advanced into Scotland to deal with Wallace's forces. The English and Scottish armies met at the Battle of Stirling Bridge on the 11th of September 1297, where the English were conclusively beaten. This defeat was an international humiliation for the English and forced Edward to return from France. He gathered an army with which he marched north in 1298 to take back control of Scotland once and for all. Edward met Wallace's forces at the Battle of Falkirk on the 22nd of July 1298 and managed to defeat the Scots, effectively ending any immediate hopes they had of independence. By the early 1300s, Edward had almost complete control of Scotland, and in 1305, William Wallace was finally captured, brought to London, and hung, drawn, and quartered. However, in 1306, another Scottish noble, Robert Bruce, laid claim to the Scottish throne and began another war. Bruce was defeated at the Battle of Methven in 1306, and afterwards fled to avoid capture. In 1307, Bruce began conducting hit-and-run raids on English forces, prompting Edward to place more focus on the Scots. Edward's health was failing, but still he marched out at the head of his army. However, on the road to Scotland, he contracted dysentery and died on the morning of the 7th of July 1307, just south of the Scottish border. The king's body was taken back to London and laid to rest in an unusually plain tomb in Westminster Abbey. King Edward I is today considered to be one of the most effective, capable and notorious English monarchs of the Middle Ages. By the standards of the time, Edward I was the very epitome of a warrior king, whose reign shaped and indeed still shapes the geographical and political landscape of the British Isles today. You have been watching the History Chronicles. We'd love to know what you think of King Edward I. Please let us know below, and if you enjoyed our video, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Also, if you'd like to support our work going forward, please visit our Patreon page. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles.